Thousands of authors have made the jump to self-publishing. Now you can take control of your own destiny and get your book published today with help from self-publishing experts Adam Stemple and Chris Wallace on the Written Well podcast. Welcome to episode five of the Written Well podcast. How are you doing this week, buddy? I'm doing excellent. How's yourself, buddy? Good, because I haven't had to do any revising this week. <laughs> I was working on a map for a book I got coming out uh, this year, um, which is not uh, what I usually do, but it was actually a lot of fun. I had I, I had someone fall through. You joy. Yeah. So. I made a map of a fantastic world. <laughs> That's right. What's great is um, I did it in such a way that I didn't have to worry about inconsistencies. It's kind of, you know, it's a map uh, made in a very old style. And so, and I didn't put a, a, a compass on it. It's, you know, it's not supposed to be completely accurate. So if it doesn't match up with the text exactly, well, it gives you a general idea of where everything is. You know, which was about as good as we could expect from the world I'm depicting in the in the book itself. I found a, a couple of pieces of software that were pretty interesting for map making, for like especially for fantasy stuff, and I ended up using them for like you know being a little bit of an outliner. First, I had the idea for the book, and I and I created the map, and as I wrote the book, I created the map to figure out what you know. It helped me plan yeah. out the book. It was really. Uh, oh, helpful. absolutely. Very helpful. Yeah, I, I, the first version of this map I made before I had written a single sentence in this book. Mm -hmm. I had actually, I did, this was one I wanted to do a very big uh, fantasy trilogy. Uh, my first fantasy trilogy, uh, it's big thematically and, uh, and with plot and stuff, but I kept the world intentionally small because I didn't want to get swamped by the size of the world. Uh, but having done that, I wanted to do a big fantasy on a big world that, you know, with lots of stuff that exists outside of the immediate uh, purview of the characters within it. So I did all the world building first, huge world. And I did, you know, thousands of years of history and and cultures of clashing and did. combining. Yeah, of course <laughs> I did. And so I did a hand drawn map, which is terrible. Uh, but then I use I use a program called Wonder Draft, uh, which is a very cool mapping program. Uh, especially for fantasy type stuff. But then I did uh, actually pulled a lot of stuff off of that and then used that mostly just for the base of the map and then filled in a bunch of stuff in Photoshop. Hmm. But it was it was a, a full week down the down the creative rabbit hole and I just kind of poked my head up and I'm like, huh, what have I missed? Anything going on in the world? And that's a traditionally published book, right? uh independent publisher so it's really uh it's uh but it's a publisher it's, per... it's a publisher yeah but it's like a so you didn't have uh, to make a map for them uh no but the book needs a map and uh you know what I just, they're I just, me really is I just distribution you, and an audiobook yeah i've been around enough creatives to know that you were going to add them this and that that you know, if you'd have sold it to a traditional <laughs> publisher, they still would might have made them a map. Uh, I did make a map. I, John and I made a map for uh, one of our one of uh, a trilogy, but then they really dumbed down his beautiful hand drawn map, and I was kind of annoyed. Hmm. Uh, we made a very he made a very cool map and a complex map. It actually had a, a spinnable wheel on it uh, used to calculate where the uh, where the shifting lands were at any time. Um, which is discussed in the book, the calculations you have to make, uh, and they get rid of all that. And I was disappointed. I am a you gigantic nerd. That very is... special nerd power. <laughs> you know, if you can't enjoy the peripheral bits about writing, I mean, there are other jobs you could just do, you know, where they just pay you and stuff. Absolutely. Where that have benefits and things. Right, right. But... Speaking of stuff downside. about someone has to someone gets to tell you what to do. That is that is not as fun as they say. I was going to say I had our segue all li lined up. Speaking of other stuff about writing that you don't like to do, Chris, <laughs> let's talk revision. 
<laughs> yes, I've done a lot of thinking about this this week. Uh, Excellent. I think we're going to have a lot of conversations like this one where um, you're already an accomplished author. You've been doing this a long time. You figured out how you do it and you do it your way and it works for you. And uh, partly because I'm newer and partly because I just research things endlessly, I will have learned a hundred ways to do it and not necessarily chosen one that I use all the time yet. <laughs> yeah. So I'll talk well, about all the I... other ways that things are done. You know, this is this is a this is kind of how these a lot of these are probably going to go. Well, what I hope we talk about, and what I really like to talk about, is why I do the things I do. Because it, it doesn't matter as much mm -hmm. uh, how I do it; it matters why I do it. Because those are those aims are generally going to be the same for every writer. What I'm trying to get is good comprehension, um, consistency, and cohesiveness. I call them the, the three C's of, of revision. And everybody's trying to come out with a comprehensible, consistent, and cohesive book. You know, you're trying to sew everything together. And there's a variety of different ways to do that. Well, that brings me to my first question, which is what is the goal? Are we are we talking today when we say revising? Are we talking about making a second draft? Are we talking about editing or proofreading uh we talk is that is that all all of it are we talking about all the way to a final draft what are you what are we talking about I, here what is our goal i i call revision all of that all of that including so when i was publishing traditionally i would revise everything and then i'd send it off to the publisher and then i'd get an editorial letter you know sometimes a paragraph sometimes nearly a novel itself and then I'd revise based on that criteria. Criteria. Um, it was never absolute. If I disagreed with something, I would say stet and say, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, they would also send me a copy edit, which the same thing. I'd, I'd go over the edits they made uh, and see if I agreed with all of them. And it's a bit of a painstaking process, but could, but can be uh, very useful. It was especially useful for me to go through that process uh, in nine traditionally published novels before I started doing all of that for myself. Um, Working with an editor has been really, really great for me. It's, when I it's started writing opening. for magazines, I would then, you know, if you write for a magazine, they send it to you. And so I would save the Word file and I would open it up and then open up the magazine and see what my editor did. Because with, with magazines, you send it to them, they don't send edits back. The, yeah, they don't, yeah, they don't want your opinion. They don't give a shit. <laughs> and so I could see what it was that they wanted, right? And I was a new writer and eager to be continue to be published and want this big guy to be happy. So I learned to give him exactly what he wanted. And after about a year, he stopped. There stopped being a difference between the word file I sent him and what he published in the magazine. And he he then he was ecstatic. He told me, "Look, your stuff is great. It's exactly what I want. You're the best writer we have. We love this." And I went to a new a new magazine because that one went under as magazines do. And that guy wanted different stuff. And it took me like three or four <laughs> months to figure out what that guy wanted and mm -hmm. how he wanted it different. Um, and going through each of these, you know, different editors working with a bunch of different people, I was able to see, okay, if I don't, if I don't send this product with this level of polish, then, uh, then it's, they're not going to be happy with me and they're not going to pay me or they're not going to give me more work or whatever it is. That helped me a lot. And then, you know, having my friends look at my work when many of my friends are writers has also been a big help, too. I, I talk a lot with our friend David Perry about magazine writing, who writes, who writes, uh, he's a journalist and writes for a lot of uh, big publications uh, doing that. And he talks a lot about the individual editors that he works with and what they want and what their style is and how it meshes with his and what he changes um when he's pitching to them uh, rather than to other people. And, you know, part of his whole process is collating these different stories into boxes containing the editor's name of who he's going to pitch it to, not physically, but in his mind. Mm -hmm. This is an article for this person. This is an article for this person based on their style of editing and, and what the content of the paper is too. But if it's a bunch of different news sources, they're all going to cover the same stories 
And if he has a, a editorial on that story, you know, the only difference is going to be, you know, what style does he want to write it in for which publication or which publication will match the style he's written it in, you know, and that really and, cuts uh, down on the number of submissions he has to do. And he sent in a story to the anthology. So I am one of his editors now too. I have a, Excellent. I have a whole bunch. I, of, I looked uh, at that story. I gave him, I critiqued that story for him. I love that story. That's the, the duck hunting story. Yeah. That's a, that's a great a, one. Yeah. I have a red lined uh, word file to send back to him sometime this week, actually. Perfect. That's, that's super fun. So, uh, when you're doing this, um, you take this first draft. That's uh, admittedly. Well, let me finish. Asked. Let me finish answering the question you asked okay. first, though, because it's it's this entire process. But it's it that's it's going to be different for a lot of people because I do I do my own proofreading and editing and line edits uh, and uh, what's the other type of edit they talk about? Copy edit, line edit, and, uh, copy um... edit and. And, uh, and the, forget, one that's, the one that's one that's development yeah, developmental yeah. uh, you know and I I do all the editing myself for the for the stuff and it's um, is it toweringly arrogant to do that yes um, but I have a great critique group and uh, not too much slips by uh, the beauty of self publishing is when you catch it later you can still go and fix it and it'll be fixed from that time on. Yeah. Um, but a lot of people use professional copy editors and and, and professional line editors and, and developmental editors. And that's good too. If you want to spend the money, it will improve your, improve your writing. Um, but that's still all part of the, the, the revision umbrella for me. Yeah. And, and one of the reasons that, you know, there's so many self-published authors I've talked to that say, Oh yeah, I, I used to pay people to do that stuff, but I don't do that anymore. Well, they, they, they speak of it so dismissively. They often in, in other podcasts and writing articles about it, whatever, they'll talk about it dismissively like, I, I, that was wasted money. I don't do that anymore. But it wasn't. The reason they don't do it anymore is because they did it. They learned from right. it. They don't need to do it anymore. I don't pay somebody to edit my stuff either because I've written a couple million words that I've sold. And, and I've, I've gotten feedback from editors and from the websites that I sell things to, and you know, and so I know, and I'm also using all the all the tools when I need to. If I'm if I'm selling a piece, I run it through Grammarly and Hemingway to see what they've got to say about it, and I use all the stuff in in Word as I'm writing as well. So I've got a lot of help with my editing too, but and and revising as well. But the you know paying paying to have that done the first few times isn't a bad idea. Yeah, I mean, it, no, if nothing else, no. you can pay a yeah. proofreader a few hundred dollars. And get a bunch of notes back from a proofreader that will at least make your book better and, and point out some things that you missed, you know, it, it, even if they're not like doing anything like developmental editing where they're making any real, you know, major suggestions, at least it's going to help. Frankly, I should uh, pay for a proof editor, not because a lot gets by, but it would save me the hours of uh, checking then and then through a hundred thousand word book. I just, you know, find all the ends and check them, find all the thans and check them. And then I'm checking, you know, so because there's some specific ones I, I screw up. I screw up less because I've got negative conditioning now for all the ones that I right. have screwed up. But, you know, a proofreader would would just slay that kind of stuff. And that's that's the only part, really, of the revision process that I dislike is that proofreading stuff. And also what. uh a real job of of proofreaders that a lot of people don't know is they are the consistency checkers because i have a little poem that i heard just recently for revision which is roses are red her eyes are blue but i said they were brown on page 52 <laughs> so and generally uh, generally a proofreader will catch that well, proofreaders easy. are detail oriented people and they like details so they will find things that aren't even their job to find as well they like that stuff yeah and uh like to, i'm detail oriented but i can't remember the details <laughs> right <laughs> uh grammarly and pro writing aid and uh there's a few other things as well will handle all of that kind of stuff pretty well i think you know as as ai creeps into everything 
uh, I think proofreaders are going to be the one one of the things that it hits first. It's going to be a long time before it's really writing good copy and doing you know that kind of stuff. But right. but proof, proofreaders are going to be less useful than they were. I don't know if it'll catch everything you know right anytime in the next few years, but that is the the first place where. I found that AI is actually quite useful is with those kinds of programs. They they uh, find spots in my copy, the, the kind of things that I would just read over 10 times and never pick it up. And I know I, I, I know it's wrong as soon as I see it. I just would gloss right over it and not read what was actually there. That's the stuff it catches for me. I got to check out Grammarly because the sometimes I'm writing such stylized stuff that, that most of the grammar catching stuff I just have to shut off or a spell check would take 114 hours and would give me nothing useful yeah yeah just it I, would be it would just be solid green lines underneath my entire right. book I I use Hemingway for everything as well uh you're you're you know so obsessive already about sentence structure it probably that, that may not do you any good but but Hemingway will pick up um overly complicated up sentences on I've loosened up on commas recently. It's been very oh, freeing. That's good. <laughs> uh, and and I have a whole uh, list of those things in an article working that are, that is working for the website. So, uh, um, you can check those out and see which ones you like. Because I compared all the uh, major things like Pro Writing Aid and Grammarly, and I wish I could remember some of the other names, but there are a bunch of them, and they kind of do different things. So you can figure out which is the one that'll do the things you want, hopefully. Very cool. So our goal then, if we're talking about all of it, our goal is the final product. When we're revising, our goal yep. is just to get to the final product. So um, this seems to be a, a thing I kind of expected as I went and learned about the revising process, that everybody would just do this wildly differently. In fact, they don't. Uh, a lot of people do this in a, in a pretty similar pattern um, where they put the first draft away for a little bit, pick it back up, go through it and find the big problems, fix them. Uh, some people call that a second draft. Some people just call it the first step in the revision process, but they get to the point where the story mm -hmm. is correct. And then they go through, uh, you know, some people will do 10 drafts. Some people will do one more draft, uh, depending on you know what your process is there. But then they'll go through and get the book right, and then it's time to get the book polished. So like most people will describe it in those four steps, even though each of those steps might be different for them. It's like the stages of grief; they're not in order. You <laughs> can go back and do the other ones again and again. Yeah, I call I actually call them passes. I got the first draft and then everything else is just just revision passes. And I do, you know, this when you talked about how you hated just going through the book again so thickly. And I like I will do that. But that's usually like the last I'll do like one in the middle of all my passes and I'll do a couple more like that at the very end. And by that time, stuff is mostly clean. So I'm really just reading it and uh, remembering that I actually like the book. Um, but I do a lot of targeted passes, you know, where I'm looking for specific things, um, you know, checking consistency. I will read books with multiple point of view. I'll read them just one point of view all the way through, ignoring everything else. That can be very useful con for consistency of character. You got one character who you're only seeing every third chapter or so. You can easily have that character kind of drift. You can lock it in. I do sure. passes for, I'll do a smell pass where I'm just going in and just skimming, skimming, skimming. Oh, there could be a smell here. Putting in some smells. Uh, I do a, um, I do dialogue passes where I'm going to get each character um, their own specific dialogue style. Um, there's a great word. Uh, and if you don't know it, you should know it. It's idiolect. Dialect is how a group of people talk. Idiolect is how a certain person talks. So a certain person will be speaking within their dialogue, but within 
that, they will also have their own personal things. And you I don't have to overdo it with that. The uh, concept is and never had a name for it. So now I do. Yeah, it's I like having names for things. It help, helps me remember to do them. Uh, so going in and have a couple of different little dialogue quirks for each of your characters. If you do it right and do it subtly, it really helps to to separate them out and make them complete different people. It's a thing you I know, notice go, in books that are good. Yeah, uh, I do. Know, it's a thing that I'll really stands out to me actually. that, you know, I think a, a, an author is really a wizard when uh, the quotes uh, that start a paragraph because somebody's saying something in a group of people, I don't need to know who said it because I know who said it from what they said. Right. Yeah, you, you can know? tell who's talking by the way they're speaking without yeah. using uh, Mark Twain type uh, dialect. Right. In it doesn't the, uh, have to. It, it should say Bob said a lot of the time at the end. But if I don't yep. need that, because I already know Bob's the one who says this kind of stuff, then, you know, then uh, that makes I think that makes for a great reader experience. Well, well, that's another C as well as clarity. You have to be very sure during your dialogue that the reader knows who is talking. You know, during the action, they have to know who's punching who, you know, it's uh, and sometimes when you're just rolling it along. True in real life, too. It did. Yeah, absolutely. One yeah, of the things no that I really watch them. out for, not so bad with me anymore, but I see in a lot of uh, new writers is what I call shorthanding things. Uh, and it's one of my very common uh, critiques with new writers is that it's very difficult to distinguish when you're writing what you as the author knows and what the reader knows. And you'll shorthand some stuff on the page because you know it in your brain. And you don't even realize it. And I, I keep reminding them to know you have to explain that outright. No one is going to get that. Only you know that. You know, some things that seem painfully obvious to the author are completely impenetrable to the reader. And I, I think about that often and the balance between that and trust your reader, which is, yep. I, I talked all night one night with Steve Bruce about how he, he said, no, trust them more. No matter how much you trust your reader, trust them more. They're smarter, smarter than you think. They'll figure it out. They're immersed in the story. They're gonna, they're gonna figure it out. And just you know, I, mm -hmm. I think about that all the time. And then how do I trust them more? And also make sure they know what the hell is going on. Because yes, you have to uh, trust you know, them completely. And then they're like, "Who's punching who here?" And you go, "Oh, I did not say. Uh, I'm sorry." <laughs> it's well, the well, difference between trusting them and not actually telling them. Right. You know, it's that's what's fun about writing heist uh, books or stories is the trick is you have to tell the reader everything and the, and fool them at the same time. That's the fun thing about mm -hmm. heist movies is when the plan goes wrong and then you find out later, no, that was the plan all along. And if you go back and can see that they showed you that was the plan or they gave you all the materials and you just assumed it was going this way, uh, it's, it's a fun trick to pull off. And that's when that's when it's good when you're not actively tricking them. You're like, no, you could have figured it out. You just decided to believe me. Yeah, the Usual Suspects is my favorite movie, so I'm with you. Oh yeah, and yeah. and that's my favorite part about writing uh, things that have any surprises in them. You know, I've got I've got a whole vigilante book where uh, there's a huge twist ending, and I had to go back and build all the things into it to make the yep. ending work. And it that was the most fun part of writing the book. That's a part of revision that I can enjoy is when I'm yeah. making the story work because I've figured out now what the, you know, what the story is. And so now I'm making it work and solving those puzzles. That's super fun. The stuff between the puzzles that I had to just make sure was right. is Boring as hell. But like, how does he, how do I clue in the reader here without cluing in the reader here is a super fun puzzle to solve. I feel like you will enjoy revision more as you break it down into smaller and smaller chunks and look at those smaller chunks as puzzles to solve. You know, and and you start to see when you're breaking down those things, it's much easier to see, wow, my then and then pass had had far few errors than it did in my last book. And even less than it had three books before, rather than going through line by line and just getting to the to the end six days later and going, oh, what a freaking slog that was. You know what I mean? Well, so you can actually see process in in all these individual little bits. Yeah, I mostly. You know, I'm doing a, there could be a smell here. Look, I I put in a smell. Excellent yeah. job. I uh, I do think that we should uh, 
that you should write another book uh, on on writing just to call the smell pass. Just do it. that the should be pass. Adam yeah. Stemple's smell pass method. I think that would be. But I, I mostly joke about hating subtitle. Pull my finger. <laughs> um because i i've gotten i've gotten over that somewhat and and also you know me of 20 years ago uh you know grumpy me would uh would would just stay mad about it uh i'm not that guy anymore and and i just like okay how can i like this and i've you know i've kind of worked my way around it and figured out that and some of it is you're right that that uh breaking it into to different pieces is is part of it and and then just not seeing it the same way um you know, Emma Bull said, uh, stop seeing it like uh, you're having to fix something and start seeing it like you get to make this thing beautiful. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that was that really hit because because to her, she, when she said it, I could tell in her voice she meant it. She was like, I love revision because I get to make a thing beautiful. And that really stuck. That really stuck with me. That was a couple of years ago. And, and I've taken that to heart some, too. Here's my question of the week for you, uh, because the real reason that I've done that, that I, we're, we're building this whole big company is just so that I can pepper all my writer friends with more questions. Is, uh, <laughs> Have you found it's not very difficult to get writers to talk about the process? Most of them. Yeah, it's very easy. much harder to get them to shut up about the process than it is to get yeah. them to start. I I started bribing them with liquor, um, you know, Smart. I yeah, it's amazing. Uh, and I thought, oh, these people really love to drink. And then it turns out if I show up without liquor, they still talk. I thought I was wasting <laughs> scotch on all these people. Just wasted gallons of booze. Ah, damn it. <laughs> and, uh, and probably. He's learned the secret. Shut it down. <laughs> and now I have no writer friends but Adam. Uh, Who doesn't drink anymore. So uh, you have. Uh, you know, maybe maybe some of it's learned, but I, I think some of it is a gift for uh, keeping a creative piece in your head. You remember a gajillion songs. You remember a gajillion guitar solos. You remember a gajillion books. You can hold a whole book in your head and 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 work on it without. Uh, you know, it's it's pro probably part of your uh, your ADD superpower, but. When I'm going back and looking at some stuff this week, it's it's time for me to go back to some of these writing projects, and I got to pick one because I've had a ton of other work to do the past couple months and haven't uh, picked up any of these fic fun fiction projects that I'm working on. I have trouble working on things once I get about halfway through a novel. Now I have to remember everything that's happened, and if I haven't outlined it really tight. I don't know everything that's happened. And if I go back through and I spend a day going back through and reading it and learning what's going on and, and going back to my notes and formulating this whole thing, and then four other things come up because I have nine jobs. Uh, and a week later I go back, I don't remember any of that stuff again. And so for me, it's kind of either woodshed, like this week I'm going to work on this book and not do anything else. Or I just keep, I have to keep going and figuring out what it was again and not making any progress. What are your thoughts on that? There is no panacea for that. There's God, no it. real solution. Yeah, it's hard. Um, I just am going back to work on the sequel to this book that is coming out uh, this year with Crossroad. And I had to go back and reread the, the, the seven chapters I had done already uh, because I remembered nothing. Um, and sometimes you just got to do that. And sometimes you got to do it multiple times. Um, taking notes is your friend. I like to have a little, especially when I'm working on secondary world fantasies, I definitely have a, a pretty extensive note document, which is essentially a, a, you know, a world, my own little world Wikipedia there, you know, with lists of gods and, and characters and who's related to who and all that. And there, there are various programs that do that as well um really well i tend to just write it out just because that's how i think yeah i have um, a bunch of books that i have outlined but, in dynalist and yeah uh, but i mean you I'm, you I'm just going back through the the book i've decided is the one to work on now and put and mm -hmm. 
putting all those chapters in Dynalist and doing a little outline so that if I do lose a week and have to go back to it, I have all that there and I, I don't have to yeah. do that process again. Good good notes and woodshedding is, yeah, it's it's time management, which sadly a lot of pe creative people are terrible at, and I'm one of them. So I, you know, I end up just rereading a lot of stuff and it's, you know, but it's, it's not the worst thing in the world. I enjoy my own stories. So sometimes I get surprised by stuff. What's great is when you read lines that you think are hilarious and you don't remember writing. Yes. Yeah. That happened to me a bunch of times recently going through the the comedy thing we're writing together. Yeah. I, I read through it and thought, oh, I forgot how funny that was when That's I wrote that. Hilarious. That great. Uh very funny. Many uh people I've collaborated with and many people who've collaborated with others um have written books where they both writers think the other person wrote certain sections that they love. They're like, I love that line. You did great with that. And they're like, I didn't write it. You wrote that. No, you wrote that. <laughs> But yeah, there's no there's no easy way around it. Uh, my memory is so bad. I don't know why I remember. Uh, I remember song arrangements really, really well. Uh, I mean, lyrics. Have, I, lyrics actually know, I, I can actually answer that one for you. You have a, a worse version uh, of what I have, which is that your contextual memory is excellent and mm -hmm, your rote yeah. memory is horrible. Yeah, well, and the contextual and the memory is a very memory, powerful thing. And the contextual memory has has arisen because my rote memory is so terrible. Uh, I can't remember directions uh, and I can't remember how to get a place to a place, even if I've gone there uh, a few times. So I got really good at reading maps, you know, and, and you adjust. I actually am just 750 words in a, in a essay on, uh, the way people with severe ADHD experience time differently from other people. My wife has talked to me about that. She does not have, yeah, it's, she has a, it's ADHD bad and she does not experience time. I, if I wait five minutes to come to bed after she does, I've been gone an hour and why did I take so long? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a strange thing. And it's the, someone, researchers have been talking about, uh, <clears throat> it doesn't, uh, ADHD doesn't, uh, memory doesn't, um, you don't really remember things sequentially. It's all emotionally charged with who was there and this and that. And and so, you know, memories from 20 years ago have equal weight to something that happened yesterday because they're, they're just not sequenced in that, in that way. Sweet. I talk about how it gets me in trouble with people because I'll, you know, it doesn't occur to me that they might be mad maybe that I haven't called them in five years. And I'm just on the phone. Hey, how's it going? Like nothing has changed because in my mind, it hasn't. I just talked to them. Yeah. I remember yeah. talking to them. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, yeah fuck you. <laughs> I'm like, well, I suppose your phone worked too, but you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> then again, um, they may have called me and I forgot. So it's, <laughs> I get in trouble. Speaking of time, do you think that we need to put the first draft away? before we go back to it? Do we need to give it, do we need some time separation between finishing that first draft and starting the revisions? If you need to do that, then you need to do that. Most people need to do that. Um, it's generally a good idea just to clear it out a little bit so you can so you can spot stuff uh, that you didn't. It's related to the, the shorthanding when you're writing it. Um, no matter how good an editor you are, you tend to gloss over certain sections of your own work. You already wrote it. You already know what it says. Though sometimes, you know, it doesn't say exactly what you think. And it goes back to how the, the human mind works. We're gestalt thinkers, uh, where the sum is greater than, than the whole. We make connections. You've seen those paragraphs of words where they just have, they have all the letters in the word and they have the, the, the first, yeah. first letter and the last letter. And it's perfectly readable. Now, this doesn't work all the time. They cherry pick those words. But the fact remains that it's perfectly read readable, even though there are no words in it. It's just the jumbled up letters mm -hmm. in the shape of the words you know. But that's how the mind works. So we make these jumps. And when you're reading them and you've written this paragraph or you remember writing this paragraph, you might skip it, even though 
like I said last week, when I'm moving really fast, sometimes I'll think it and I'll write half the sentence and keep going, thinking I've typed out the whole sentence because I already thought to the end and moved on to the next one. And if my fingers didn't catch up, well, too bad. Yeah, I, so, I get a lot of that. I've written a description. I'll get to that paragraph and go, this is the paragraph that describes the streetlight. And I don't need to read it now. I remember what the streetlight looks like. I know what's there. Right. And I'll just I'll just very just important to thinking. read that. And then it turns out I screwed up the decision description of the streetlight pretty bad, but I never yeah. caught it. That's what something I that's something that's very natural to do. You know, and that's that's another thing to add to your to your passes of things, which is like, OK, this time I'm just going to do a, I just want to go through. I want to double check my descriptions and I want to check and make sure I have enough. Or maybe I tend to write too many descriptions. I want to chop those ones out that people are skimming. You know, depend. Have I written a Have I written a uh, a tight modern uh, mystery story and then gobbed it down with thirty three thousand words of description? You know, that's not gonna That's not gonna fly. That's not genre appropriate. So, you know, going through. I it really. I cannot say how much targeted passes and you don't know which ones you're going to use when you start out but they've been so helpful for me it keeps the whole reversion process fresh and you can jump around i've done whole books from the back to the front read the last chapter first and amazingly that's where i caught my most uh kind of sequence errors they really jump out at you when you're when you're running them backwards it was the, it was the strangest thing but it, there's a concept in graphic design if you're doing a poster or something and you're wondering where to put the text and you put it up there and you're like hmm flip the thing upside down so that the words make no sense and then you can just see it as shapes and that's kind of the same thing when i'm reading a book backwards i'm kind of taking the plot out of the equation because there's no plot because it's going backwards so I can see the shape of the thing more effectively. I just pulled up the list, uh, the article that I put together on editing tools. So I'm going to just put those in here for people who are listening and, and wondering about these tools we're talking about. Grammarly is the most well-known of the bunch just because they had a big budget to spend on advertising. They advertise like crazy. Um, Hemingway and Grammarly is really correcting sentences, punctuation, grammar, those kinds of things. Hemingway works on concise, short, sharp sentences. Run on sentences, it will pick up right away. Anything that's unclear, concise, could be written in a, a shorter or more clear way with um, less complicated structure. It, it'll point out to you. Pro Writing Aid does basically everything. Now, almost nothing does quite what Hemingway does, but uh, Pro, Write, Pro Writing Aid is similar to Grammarly and doesn't even does even more actually. I don't like the interface as much, but uh, it does everything from translation to clarity checks, which is a little bit like Hemingway. Uh, it does a plagiarism check online on, on, a, on the entire internet, basically, um, which is an easy thing to do yourself, by the way. Don't ever pay for plagiarism checks. Take uh, one sentence from your writing and Google it in quotes. And if it doesn't come up, you're good. Uh, uh, you know. I do, I I often do that with names I'm making up in uh, fantasy novels. I want to make sure, uh, you know, here's the name of my hero. Oh, it can't be that. That's a Brazilian serial killer. Okay, <laughs> let's let's pick something else. <laughs> I do it a lot with uh, with my content that's been shared online a lot, where like mm -hmm. you know, uh, like a poker training site will will pay me to do something or a news site, and uh, I will Google one sentence of it six months later and find the 30 sites that are all ripping it off. I don't know why, because because we they rarely do anything about these sites, but that's one of the things I do. And then if you want to look at other products, uh, SlickWrite is free and it's pretty good. The interface isn't quite as easy, which is weird because it's called SlickWrite, but it's good and it's free. WordTune is about rewriting specific sentences. It will swap subjects and you know put things in different places and show you good examples of how you could rewrite specific sentences. So if your sentence structure is the is the problem, WordTune is great. White Smoke is a lot like Grammarly, uh, and it has a ton of templates and uh, and documents that you can put things into. 
So if you want and to, when you're done, letter, and what? when you're done, uh, there's a new pope. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you want to write a cover letter or an invoice or something like that, it it has all those in it, and you can put your put your copy into that, and it will edit that and give you suggestions on that type of document. And then uh, Paper Raider is uh, for academic papers and and journalistic articles, and it will check things for errors and clarity and uh, in a, in journalistic style. So those are the kind of the the best of the bunch. There are all kinds of products coming out these days, but that's the best of the bunch when you're using software for your editing. And then, you know, the, the software that you write in is pretty important for your editing as well. You know, the reason that I like Google Docs is because I can edit from anywhere very easily, just snap right on and I can be editing on my phone or whatever. It's not as powerful as Word, but it's an easier editing tool for me. So that's why I, I end up using it a lot. And let's go to I, I want to I want to love it I just don't <laughs> Google Docs I just I, I I was just trying a new my old I had to update my computer my old invoicing software stopped working so I had to get some new one and I was trying one online that I kind of liked I'm like okay maybe I could do this cloud thing and then I go on I'm like okay and then uh yesterday it locked me out until I upgraded oh. and I said how about I just go buy a one for my desktop from this other company and you can kiss off into the sun. And that is why I distrust the cloud. Fair. Um, also, I'm old. <laughs> when in this editing and revising process, do we show it to other people? You've talked about your writing groups and, and I've put things online and you know all that kind of stuff. What, at what point are you ready to are you ready to show it to people? And at what point should we be showing it to people? It depends on your trust level um, with your critique group, honestly, and how well they how well they know you and how well they adjust their critiques to where you are in the process. You know, in general, you're going to want it as polished as possible before you show it to someone else um, because you want to put your best foot forward. However, it can be devastating then if they hate it. But you have to be you have to be prepared for that. And you have to know, much like the critiquers have to know you, you have to know your critiquers and know, you know, where they come from. One of the greatest things about uh, the people in my group is that they understand their own strengths um, and they can critique stuff outside of their strengths. But they say, look, here are my comments. But since I'd never read horror or adventure or whatever that they're reading, they say, you know, take them with a grain of salt. You know, I don't know the tropes. I don't know exactly, you know, what you're trying to do with this because it's not a genre I read. But here's what I think from a general thing. And they'll catch some, you know, catch some typos and they'll give you your opinion. And, but it's very useful, even if they don't like it, that you know that there's it's it could just be a taste issue. And more importantly, they know. And so they they generally give you a very good, uh, it's not good, but effective critique. As you trust them more, I have brought stuff to them that's very raw because I just want, I, I want to uh, brainstorm some plot ideas with them or just thinking, um, you know, the sad robot story got to a point where I, it wasn't done, but I brought it to them anyway, because I was like, this is what I think I want to do with it going forward. But I just wanted to run it by you guys, think, see if you think it was an idiotic idea. And they're like, no, we love it. I'm like, okay, okay, good. Because cool. I was like, I'm just going to, I'm not going to add any action to this. It's going to just keep going on, jumping between spaces, and it's going to be very strange. And they're like, no, that's exactly what you set up. It looks great. But I have a lot, you know, I have a lot of trust in them. And you know, but that grew. That wouldn't have, I wouldn't have brought it to them, you know, when I was still new in the group. So, yeah, so I mean, I think that's a great point that, uh, that if you have trust with these people and you're clear about what this is you're showing them and what you want out of it, you know, then yep. you can take it. Uh, you know, if you if you take a story that's a first draft and hand it to a, a, a writer's group that is used to critiquing, you know, everything, they'll look at it and go, boy, this needs a bunch of work. You got all these problems here. And you go, well, I know it's a first draft. They go, yeah, well, it yeah. sucks because it's a first draft. You should, you should have mentioned that. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. because then rather than focus on all the minutiae that sucks, you can just tell them, 
this is a first draft of a, of a 6,000 word short story. And I just want to know and like, tell them what you want. I just want to know if you think the story works in its current structure. Don't worry about the grammar, all the bad sentences, all the other mess. Uh, just is this structure in the way that this story flows and ends? Does that make sense? And they'll give you the right feedback. You just got to you have to know what you want when, if you're doing something other than a final product, you know? It, exactly. And the, you're not trying to fool them. You know, and if you do, you'll eventually, you'll always fail. I've, I've, I've brought in some stories where I know, you know, kind of in my heart, but won't, it, it won't admit to myself that there's certain weak sections that I'm just trying to kind of sneak past my writer's group. They catch them every time. Yeah. You're oh, like, yeah, tell you, that you don't need to yeah. fix it. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, yeah. yeah, I know I needed to fix it. I thought I could slip one past the goalie, <laughs> but no, you know, it's, it's not the kind of relationship where you're trying to fool them into thinking the story is great. You want the, I mean, you want them to think the story is great, but you do yourself a disservice if you're, you know, if you, if you're trying for that, you know, send it in. So, you know, it has to be more polished, the, 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 not necessarily the less you trust them, but the, the, the braver you are and the, the, the better you are at taking critique and the better you are at saying what you want and the better they are at delivering that as well. And two episodes ago, in the discussion with your mom and sister and, and, you know, hearing all three of you talk about writers groups was really helpful. If you're, if you're interested in, in critique and learning about that, go, go back and listen to that episode again. That was really good stuff from all three of you and, and how you deal with those things differently and, and the different people you go to for different things. Yep. You know? uh, yeah. And, and I think that for me, the fear of people not liking something causes is good for me. And so I don't show things to people you know, I've sent you draft material a couple of times. That's it. Nobody else sees that stuff. Uh, because you already know that sometimes I suck as a writer. And so it's fine. <laughs> but nobody else gets to know that. They, and, they don't get to know with, that. With anybody else, I want, I, I'm going to make sure that I have something that's really good before I send it to people. So that, and then, and then I'll tell them, this isn't done yet, but take a look at it. And it, it's, well, it's also real close to done, but I want, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to hear it sucks. I want to hear critique, but I don't want to hear this isn't very good. And so I'm, 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 and it's not hearing it actually. It's, I don't want to put stuff out there. I don't want people to see stuff from me that isn't very good. I don't care what they say about it. I just don't want them to see things from me that aren't good. And yet you have to be ready, even if you're bringing something that you believe is done to your critique group to hear that it's not absolutely but you know, i want especially i want, I want it to be pretty have, damn good before i put it up yeah. in front of anybody but again you can be blind to your own stuff and if you go to your critique group who's been critiquing your stuff for years and you've got this story you think is great and four out of five of them say i don't think it's done it's probably not done no matter what you think and you might want to go back and take another look. My father used to said, you can deny the solution, but you can't deny the problem. You know, if four readers you trust have a problem with what you've written, then, you know, no matter what you think about it, you better go and take another look at it. You know, give it a good, give it a good, hard, honest look. Don't just think, you know, I wrote it. It must be great. I wrote it and I like it. It must be great. You know, yeah. you got to, you got to be prepared to take that stuff to heart without insult. You know, and you got to do the same for other people. The, the the critique group is a definite give and take, and you have to you have to participate on other people's stuff. The the great part is how much you learn critiquing other people's stuff, because you see your own mistakes that you make reflected in there, and it's easier for you to correct them in someone else's first, and then you can see them in your own stuff when it comes up. You're like, oh, this is what I exactly I, I, what I told X not to do, or this is the mistake Y made that I just called them on. And here I am, you know, writing is a very humbling experience. The great news about writing is that it's almost never timed and you can yeah. go back and fix all the things. And if you're willing to work hard enough. So, so for me, reading other people's stuff and seeing how somebody else does something really well, uh, a lot of people see that and go, well, that's not what I do. I, that's, I can't do this thing the way this person does this thing. Uh, a combination of arrogance and hard work, I think I can. Whatever the thing is that somebody does really well, I'll go, oh, if I'm willing to put the work into this, I can do that. might come faster to them, 
might come more naturally to them, but I can figure out how to do that thing. If I can recognize it, I can replicate it. And I can do that, whatever that style is, whatever that thing is that they do really well. So when I'm critiquing other people's stuff, I'm always looking for, what do I like about this? And how do I do that? If somebody does something really well, I want to do that thing really well, or I want to learn as much as I can from them about the thing they do really well. I learn a lot more from from what people do well than what they do badly. When they when pe somebody does something badly, I'll just say, this is a thing, and maybe here's how to fix it. But I, I tend not to to do as well with what you were talking about, learning from their mistakes. Right? That's not something I do very well, but I do the learning from the from the good stuff really well. So I keep making the same mistakes, but the stuff that I that I improve on is brilliant. The thing about writing, I think, is when most people say, I can't do that, what they mean is, I don't do that naturally. And what you said about it not being timed, and that's the beauty of revision, as we'll say, we've said before on this podcast, and we'll say, I'm sure, many, many times in the future, the beauty of uh, writing is that you can go back and make it look like you intended that from the beginning. You know, we talked about my book, Gallic where uh you know this this very small problem turned into this you know huge conspiracy involving multiple players and all this stuff and you're like oh that was really well planned and i'm like no it was not <laughs> i discovered that plot along with my characters and then went back and and made it all work together you know and so you are you are as clever as your revision is you can write a stupid story and revise it into an absolute brain buster of a tale you know and the other thing is I, I find it funny that we have now um been in a couple of businesses together with poker and writing uh that really to be done well require uh, a combination of we used to say with poker arrogance and fear and in writing i it's a combination of arrogance and crippling self-doubt you know, vacillating between the two really actually does work well. <laughs> yeah. Or holding yeah. one rein of each in each hand, for sure. Yeah, that's right. I put on my mask. Here's my arrogant mask. Oh, here's my self-doubt mask. Here's <laughs> Whereas me, I'm just, I'm just sitting here typing, man. I don't know what you guys are doing. I have a friend who, who is an aspiring writer, but, but will just probably forever be aspiring. Um, who has asked me about it. And I say, well, uh, the way to get started is to write and, you know, go write a first draft, go, just go write, go make it terrible, do whatever, write a first draft of, of, a, of a paragraph, just write something. And, and, and then he says, well, I don't know how to write this kind of thing. And I go, just go write it. You don't have to know how to write it. You just go write it and then figure it out and go from there. There's not, you're not going to be walking through this thing and fall off a cliff and die. You just write the thing, see how it goes, come back to me with more questions. Send me the thing if you want. I'm here to help you, but I can't write it for you, so you got to go write something first. No matter how much I teach you, if you're not going to write something, it doesn't. you just get nowhere. And then if you, if you have revision questions, okay, I'll read the thing. We'll talk about revision, and then go revise it. And if, if it's not done being revised yet, come back with more questions. Like there's everybody wants to answer these questions for you. There's tons of information out there. But you have to do the stuff. And, and, and for people who want to, especially for plotters, the kind of people who want to plan a thing before they do it, writing can be really tough to get rolling because I don't yeah. know what I'm going to write yet. I know. If you knew, it would already <laughs> be written. You just got to go. and you, So you start walking and then figure out where it is you're going. You, that's kind of how you have to start. Even plotters kind of have to start with start walking and then figure out where you're going. But just get Putting things up. Some words on paper. Yep. And you, then yeah, you I, revise them and you start the revision process the same way. You start walking and then figure out where you're going. You just start revising. I have a bit more targeted revision process than that now, but I've revised a lot of stuff. <laughs> so, well, that's, the, you know, the process I'm talking about is the one that gets you past that. I don't know how to do this. Right. Right. Once you've done it and a few it, times, you know how to do it. Yeah. And then the, the, here's, the, here's the steps. You got to write something, write anything, write a paragraph, write a journal entry, write a novel, write a short story, write fanfic, write an article, write an essay, you know, write a note to your friend, anything, write something down, write an epistolary piece. It, it doesn't matter. Write something. 
uh, you know, and keep writing, try a bunch of different stuff. And actually, I find a lot of people get to that point. The next point, and it's the hard one, uh, but it's kind of only as hard as you make it, is finish something. It doesn't matter what it is. It's especially helpful if it's something of some length, you know, but because uh, once you once you finish something, you're hooked. You're hooked for life at this. And once you write a novel, you're done. You're screwed. You're a novelist now. So, I'm sorry. So <laughs> the best thing for you to do right now, don't finish it. Don't finish it. Whatever don't you do, don't go <laughs> so, there. What, what was it, Dorothy Parker? The best thing you can give an aspiring novelist is a gun to shoot themselves in the head. <laughs> <laughs> That's cheery. Yeah, cheery. No, people do a lot of complaining about it. That's why if you want a writing book, I would recommend my mother's Take Joy. Take Joy by Jane Yolen is a, a bunch of her advice, you know, from, you know, what, 70 years of writing now. And uh, it's a lot about fighting against the cliche of writers, you know, staring at a blank page till blood forms on their forehead. Mm -hmm. You know, she says, if I hated it, I wouldn't do it. She approaches every day at the computer or typewriter uh, as a as a gift, and she loves it, and she loves doing it, and she's what turning eighty four this year, and uh, shows no sign of stopping. She's heading yeah. for five hundred books now, I and so, so many you know that's the, a you know most famous authors on the planet talk that way. They they yeah. you know, they they love it, so they write a lot and they write good stuff. And then end up being a big deal because, you know, I've heard Baldacci and Dan Brown and James Patterson have all said that thing. Uh, you know, tons of people have said that. And 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 that romantic idea of, the, you know, the the bottle of half empty bottle of whiskey and the writer just scowling at the screen. And, the you know, that's that's a thing that happy writers have written uh, <laughs> that's been fun to write. You know, it's a, it's well, a concept it's not, put it, out there because it's romantic. It's it's not entirely untrue. There is a correlation uh, proven in many studies now between mental illness, especially depression uh, and um, and bipolar and creativity. Uh, and what many of us with depression do to fight that is self-medicate with drugs and alcohol. So it's not, but also this cliche came from many, many years ago when there were not all the tools and therapy and drugs to deal with uh, mental illness. So you don't have to do that. But I was just reading um, a, uh, a an article by an old science fiction writer talking about uh, the process of another old and famous science fiction writer uh, who wrote amazing stuff. Um, but his process was delay, 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 get more and more anxious until like 36 hours before the deadline, he would stay up for three days doing speed <laughs> and, uh, and write, you know, write 30,000 words a day and then turn it in. Uh, and it was great stuff, but he would always think, what could I have written if I had a healthy process and had time? I don't know for, you know, revision and stuff so and it's what, i mean it's not and what it didn't become a cliche can't... because because it doesn't exist but you don't have to, it's not a requirement right. for the position of writer and what happens if you can't score any speed yeah oh yeah yeah and you no, got then, then where then you're yeah. there's yeah, also a writer thousand words in a day without it there's also the quote i love i love deadlines i love the whooshing noise they make as they fly by <laughs> Um, when you are revising, do you, how do you track your changes and deal with versions and, you know, uh, how do you do that stuff with the rewriting and, and, and that kind of thing? When I'm writing the first, um, when I'm writing the first draft, every day I sit down at the computer and I start by saving a new copy with an incremented number. Every so. Day. Deed of Empire 1, Deed of Empire 2. Yeah. So I'm not ever so and I, so I can go back to wait wait I I liked this passage 3 days ago. 
I can go back. Oh, and so find when it. you're revising, you're doing every day. Revising as well. But when, when you're in the draft. revising, I start a new folder and I start them with Deed of Empire, REV one, Rev two, Rev three. I have text files are tiny. I can store a million text files on my on my computer and still have room for more. So, you know, I I have massive redundancy, and every once in a while, I'll send myself something uh, it, through Gmail, so it'll I store it for me. Once in a while, too. Yeah. But so I don't, I don't uh, start know, a new file every day. You, you're not. I do. Not I do. Because it's it's manual okay. undoes, man. It's retro undoes. I've because I've I've lost you know days worth of work. You know, if something crashes, you know, so I don't like that. I save obsessively and I, and sometimes I'll, I'll go through, I'll, I'll, I'll know that I'm going to go off on a tangent that I don't know if it's going to work. I'll save a new file. And like, if I'm going to like erase two pages of stuff and go off in a different direction, I'll make a new save right there with a new little title, like, you know, B or, you know, whatever I'm trying so that if I don't like it, I can retro right back to it even if it's a week later and i'm like yeah i don't like this i can go back i have it i don't have to redo those two pages that i deleted i do do that with i i, I save each chapter separately and then i do do that with you know when i'm doing the revision i'll take the chapter copy it into a new file that's the you know second draft file or whatever folder or whatever and then do mm -hmm. and then work on that and and if i'm gonna you know do make a big departure i'll do that too but uh, but but starting a new one at the beginning of the day is something I hadn't even considered. Um, I when you're I'm in that good... uh, when you're in that file, are you tracking changes in it, or are you just it's just a just a thing? I'm just I'm just typing. Yeah, I'm not I'm not tracking anything. I'm just okay. I'm just writing. So either it got better and you keep it, or it got worse and you toss it and go back to the yesterday's file. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It generally gets better. I do all right. It's more. It's more for redundancies, and then extra extra little forks. If I think I'm going off, if I'm going well, this this may or may not work. You know, sometimes you you, you know a character go, does something weird, and you're like, okay, let's follow that, and you go, nope, let's change the character. <laughs> it turns out their father is alive. Okay, let's go with that. <laughs> Uh, let's let's do a, a topic for next week, unless you've got more things to talk about with revision. We could talk endlessly about revision. Uh, and sure we'll we'll, we'll about dive revision. deeper into more specific topics as we go. You know, as we run out of things to talk about on the podcast, and we'll come back and do a whole episode on then and then. But uh... <laughs> I think no one no one wants to see an episode of me going. No, nope, more than. Okay, good. Then he did. Oh, that's good. More than. Okay, excellent. Excellent. More than. More more than? No. Okay, than. Uh, no, we should try and line up. We, we got a couple of guests we can line up, too. Might be able to do a guest for next week. Well, whenever we have a guest, we will just it's skip just whatever the subject was going to be and just do a subject good. with that guest. Uh, but I think our next subjected, our next non-guested podcast uh, we should get we should we should uh, drop the craft for a little bit and do a a, a week or two of uh, of the business. So like market Sounds research good. or cover design or something that's just way different from what we've been doing. Let's do market market research. Okay, because then I can ask you a bunch of questions. Oh, that's clever. That's clever. <laughs> Yeah, I have I have learned a lot about market research and uh, and mostly then helped other people because I haven't published enough stuff of my own in, in the fiction world that I've done all this research on yet. But I I spent a lot of time fighting with the uh, Amazon algorithm and looking looking at you know what things are working and aren't and you know how their search algorithm works. Frankly, I'm surprised that more people aren't hitting that harder. But when you look at the the real money that you can make from it it's an interesting way that they've set up amazon so that it's almost if you're going to self-publish you kind of have to self-publish by yourself and that like you know being a publisher for your 10 favorite friends is just a waste of time you're just screwed uh and so this a lot of it has to be kind of you got to do it yourself you know you can hire people to do chunks of this stuff but you can't hire somebody to do all of it and just write it just doesn't it kind of doesn't work 
And so learning but learning these skills is pretty important. And and one of the things that they was make it pretty hard to reverse engineer how the algorithm works because it's based on some information they don't give you. You know, yeah. they, they don't give you exact sales numbers. And in fact, people have, you know, there's there's a number of calculators out there where you put in the book rank and then it'll tell you approximately how many it's selling, and none of them are good. They 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 change they changes so fast that none of them are very accurate. Um and because Amazon doesn't want you to know that stuff. They don't want you to, to they don't want you to reverse engineer the algorithm. They want exactly the opposite of what I'm what I'm doing to happen. They want you to just do what makes them happy. And rather than like try to figure out what it is that they're searching for, they just want they just want you to do what makes them happy and, and work on which is the you know the safe way to go. You know, if you're trying to do search engine uh, optimization for Google, the safe way to go is just give Google what it wants. You know what it wants. Yeah. It wants you to be very clear about what you're what you're writing about, and it wants your headlines to be you know describe what you're writing about, and it wants you to create good copy that people will like and be happy they clicked on Google, the Google search result. Right? If you do mm -hmm. that, you don't have to game the system. But if you game the system a little bit, you can make a little more money. And, and on Amazon, and Amazon's taking much the same approach. And if you give them what they want, you, you write a good book, you make a good cover, you do a good description, tell people what it's about, and you're honest with what it's about, you, you, you know, Amazon likes you. But they don't like you enough to make you a lot of money unless you learn how to fine tune that stuff with market research and knowing, knowing exactly how to target your stuff. Because they don't care if you specifically make money. Amazon doesn't care about you. They would eat you. But... They care about there being a lot of quality content for people to go to and keep reading and keep paying money to read. That's what they care about. So whether you're first or a hundredth, as long as you're putting out good stuff that they like, they don't they don't care. It's to, it's well, your job think, to figure out how to be first. One of the things I think is interesting about Amazon and, and selling books on Amazon, um, and why I'm really excited about this site, is that. Honestly, I think we can easily uh, make pretty much anyone profitable uh, on Amazon, um, which does not make you're going to mean you're going to make a lot of money. You'll probably make almost none, um, but without any actual outlay of money, I can get you into the the Amazon ads and figuring out your your actual cost of sale. And, um, and and running ads that are that are profitable and getting a few people and writing a blurb that uh, that converts and you will you will not lose money. Even even if you write a book that sucks. Which is the first step. After yeah. that, it takes some you know it, it takes some much deeper dives, uh, and there's a lot more effort and research that has to go into it and it's sometimes investment of money sometimes definitely investment of time possibly in tasks you don't particularly enjoy uh doing self-promotion but just you know just with with a few things you can you can be not losing money writing you know yeah. it's a very small goal but it's also an important one that's my my favorite thing about the site is that we can offer people an actual path to success. If do if you do these things, you will be successful. Now people may not follow that. We might have a thousand subscribers and nobody follows it. But that my job is to give you the path to success and encourage you to follow it. And if you don't, you don't. But the fact that there is a clear path to success, that right with with other th with other uh, things I've been involved in, there there hasn't hardly ever been that. Certainly not in the music industry. Certainly not in poker. There's, most people can't play poker for a living. They just can't. And and if I write out the, my best estimate of a path to success, it's going to be awful vague, and it's going to be work. You know, do do the do all these things, and then hopefully maybe you'll make it. And with with uh, self publishing, you you can pull this thing off like a lot most people can. And with the way the rake works, it's even harder to be profitable at the lower limits without being super good absolutely yeah it's a, you know, it's a you very don't, you don't have that there's, there's no rake on the on the on the ads yeah <laughs> well i mean there is there is rake you're getting a you're getting you're only getting a percentage but you're getting a higher percentage than traditional publishing and uh 
and they are providing some some value. Well, as much as Amazon, I, yeah, has done I'm some really... to talk about business. There's there's certainly a clearer path in the business side there than there is a path to writing a book. Because, yeah. like we said, is you know you know you can't teach someone how to write a book. They can only learn how they write a book. And uh, but I assume after our what four podcasts here, everybody has now uh, an excellent writer and is ready to move on to the business portion. I assume we've all written an, written a novel in the month that we've been doing these podcasts. We taught them how to get started. We taught them how to write a draft. Now we taught them how to revise. Within a week or two, they should have a final draft and be and then it's time to teach them how to sell it. Yeah, yep. that's the plan. So, so we're going to cover uh, everything from you know real deep dives into the craft. We may talk about character development or villains or heroes or you know a, a deep dives into much smaller things that we want to talk about. And we have all kinds of weird skill sets between us. Adam's written, uh, uh, you know, done done music for spoken word albums and like all kinds of strange things. I did. I've done consulting for a whole bunch of different publishers. I've worked with a bunch of uh, people who write widely different things, from uh, a children's book that that uh, they paid the somebody else to do the illustrations and and publish themselves to working with erotica publishers to to publishing a fantasy thing for a sci-fi friend. Okay. You know, so we're going to cover all these different topics in more deep dives. This, these first few episodes have been pretty broad to kind of introduce you to, if you're starting with episode one, like how this whole thing works and 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 what to do. So the, the how writing a book works part has been these, these first three, the three episodes that have been on, uh, on those three subjects. I think we've, we've gone like a very broad overview of, of how this whole, well, writing a book and, and revising process. Well, because, works. because frankly, writing the book is a deal breaker. If you don't write a book, you can't do any of the other stuff. Yeah. What <laughs> you are you going to advertise? A blank page and you can't sell a blank page either. Mm -hmm. Though I did see a book called uh, Boston driving etiquette, which was just a, a blank journal. Nice. That was pretty solid, but, <laughs> but it's been done. So hmm. that's too bad that it's been done already. Was it marketed well? Cause maybe we could do it again. I saw it in an airport, so I think oh, it was yeah. doing our. Right. Yeah, there we have it there. <laughs> okay, so next week is market research, and we're going to talk research. about this is and this. By the way, um, Adam wanted to talk about craft at the beginning because he loves talking about craft, and it seemed fine. We really should have done market research first because you should do it before you write your book. So we should have made market research episode number two. Uh, and, and talked about this because it's a thing that you want to know before you start writing, before you start outlining or plotting or whatever you're going to do, this market research, you know, uh, um, recently worked on a book that was quite wonderful and and not researched in any way toward a market and was like kind of crossed a number of genres. And um, now there are four people right now listening to this podcast who think I'm talking about them. And I am. This is <laughs> this is the people that approach me with. Will you help One me? of them is me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, no. Okay. Five people. Five. Yeah. Uh, this is the thing that is constant when people approach me and have written a book and want to self-publish it. Is uh, I'll look at it and go, okay, this is a pretty neat book. It's you know you've clearly put a lot of work into this. A lot of them have paid a publisher, sometimes a, a or an editor, and sometimes the editor is the person who sends me sends them to me um, and then, you know, it'll be a solid book. And I just know it's not going to sell. There's just, it, it's just not going to sell. And I wish that I could help them. And they'll say, well, can you help me set up an advertising campaign? And I'll say, yeah, you're going to lose money on it. This book is not written to market. Uh, I love it. I'll try to be as encouraging as I can be about the product they've given me because often it's quite good, but it's just not going to sell. It's, you know, what you have invented is a combination uh, can opener and guitar pick. And and no matter how great it is, nobody wants that, right? So uh, next of time, you make it ton of money, <laughs> right? Uh, so I tell them next time when you write the sequel, you write your next book. Now that you've done it, you know how to do it. You can do this thing. Next one's going to be easier. Talk to me first, and I'll teach you about market research, and we'll talk about you know how to make sure your next one actually sells. So that's what well, we'll that's cover right. next week. I don't mind going, doing doing the craft stuff first because, like you said about um first-time writers who are who are plotters 
it, it's a natural impediment to getting started on the book. So if you've got someone who wants to be a writer and you tell them, well, first you should do all this market research and their eyes are going to go big and that's the last you'll see them. You know, like I said, the, you, you, you need to write for how to get, then you need to finish something and then you need to figure out how to, how to, how to sell it. And it may involve not selling that first book. You know, everybody's got a novel somewhere that they've written and won't se- and and will never sell. And, and that's just, it's, an, it's, it's natural. It's no, it's no big deal. And you get less precious about it, you know, the more books you write. So I think it, I think it would be very tough to tell a, a beginning writer. It, but again, I've seen online people who have done um, market research, um, started social media about the book and this and that, and they haven't written a, a word and it's their, and it's their first book. And once they, but they've, you know, that's the way you should do it. But I think it's very hard for, for new writers to look at all that when they're also facing the existential dread of trying to get a hundred thousand words out of their brain and onto paper. So I don't, I don't mind. You're not wrong, but I think it's, it's, it's not working in the real world to think that you can start from that and be a writer. It's almost like the market research. Yes, you should do it first, but it's easier for a, a more experienced writer to do that first than it is for someone trying to do it with their very first book they've ever written. They don't yeah. even know if they're going to finish it. They even, might be afraid. Why would I do all that market research when I don't, which I don't want to do when I don't even know if I can write a book yet. Right. Uh, I think it's even in the language that people use. Uh, they'll say, I'm going to write a book someday, or I want to be right. a writer. I want to write a book. No, if you're going to be a writer, you're going to write a lot more than one, buddy. You you, you, <laughs> you may you may have a favorite writer who's published five. He's written forty, or he's, <laughs> or he's written seven, but he wrote those five and rewrote them and rewrote them and polished and pol- and you know like it, it, it's not he wrote a thing. Those five you, books fifty times. Yeah, it's not a thing where you go, okay, it's time now, and you know you get some sort of goofy hat and a, and a half a bottle of whiskey, and you just start. Argh. And then at the end, you've got the thing and you're done. And you that's not how any of this works. Be, you know, we've talked a lot about it in this episode. Be happy. Enjoy writing. Uh, you're, you're reading a story while you're writing it. Have fun with it. Get those words all out. Then don't be mad that you have to fix them. You knew that you were going to have to fix them. You just had fun reading a story. Stop crying. Go back and start fixing them. Now you're having fun polishing this story to make it beautiful. This thing that you've created, now you're making it pretty. It's like you built a car and it doesn't have paint on it yet. Make it pretty now and then make it super pretty and then figure out who to sell it to. And these are all things that can be fun and that you can and that you can do if you just start doing them and aren't afraid of doing them. So when people say, I'm going to write a book someday, I know those are those are not writers. Those are people who think it would be fun to have written a book. And they're never going to write anything. Get rid of the someday. Someday is now. Yeah. Either, yeah, either you're going to write a book now or you're not going to. I don't want to hear about someday. I, and sometimes I tell those people, I'm going to play professional hockey someday. And they look at me like, what? You know, <laughs> me and Wayne Gretzky like, have won so many championships together. <laughs> you combine our records. It's amazing. <laughs> Do you skate? Well, no, but I don't think that's that hasn't been an impediment to mine and Wayne Gracie's, Gretzky's combined success. Yeah. I wrote a book with two other poker world champions. Between the three of us, we have $28 million in winnings now. <laughs> 27 million of that is the other two guys but whatever it's 28 million the three of us 28 million that's right i i, I and my mother have together we have written nearly 500 books <laughs> well <laughs> james patterson and i together have made over a billion dollars writing yes if you combine our earnings james patterson and i have made so much money Oh, All right. If well, you combine my earnings of writing books with James Patterson's, we have made almost as much as James Patterson. <laughs> <laughs> so you're a writer and you win the lottery. What are you going to do? Well, I'm just going to keep writing till it's all gone. <laughs> no, that's really being a musician. I guess I'll just keep gigging till it's all gone. Yeah, I'm just going to keep playing the banjo. <laughs> 
I think that's it for this episode before we get excellent to wear on people. Uh, I will talk to you next week when we either have an excellent guest, maybe from your writer's group, or where we talk about market research. Sounds good. I'll talk to you soon, buddy. All right. See you, man. Thank you for listening to the Written Well podcast, your source for anything and everything in the world of self-publishing.